Good morning, everyone. Oh, good uh, morning. <laughs> <laughs> I realize it is not morning for everyone. <laughs> hey, guys. Hello, hello. Hello. Awesome. Hey, guys. Hey. So, quick reminder to everyone, especially new folks on the call. Um, this call is recorded from the time it starts. Uh, and then when it ends, it is automatically uploaded to YouTube. So do realize that you are being recorded and that what you say here will be public. Yep. Cool. That said, here's the link to the meeting minutes. And if folks can start adding themselves to the uh, meeting minutes, that would be useful. Oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, now that the, the race is on, um, <laughs> and then usually it takes a few minutes for everyone to form up um, and we'll get going then. By the way, uh, do feel free if you have things you want to add to the agenda. Um, we usually start the meeting with agenda bashing. We haven't formally started that yet, but you can go ahead and add things to the agenda anyway. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty free flowing about the agenda. For folks who are just arriving, um, <clears throat> we usually allow a few minutes for folks to turn up. Usually it takes till about five after. Um, also, please keep in mind that the meeting is recorded from the time that it starts and is automatically posted um, to YouTube afterwards. So everything you say is being recorded and will be public. If folks could please go to the meeting minutes that I just stuck in the chat. <clears throat> Sorry, hang on. I stuck them in the chat wrong that I just stuck in the chat. Um, the, you know, we keep a list of attendees. This is actually super useful. So if you could add yourself to the attendee list, that would be great. Hello, can I get a uh, mic check? I hear you. Fantastic. Let me go ahead and actually start sharing the uh, meeting minutes. That typically makes things easier for folks. Can everyone see the meeting minutes? Um, yes. Yes, yes. Awesome. Also, we need um, some additional things on the agenda. So we have to talk more about um, various things other than where we're going to stick the repo. Yeah. So, um, do you want to talk at all about some of the SDK stuff today, Nikolai, or are you still sort of ruminating? Uh, yeah, I can. I can cool. try to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I think we're all just. You know, many of us are just getting back from the Christmas break. Um,
Do we have um, Mathieu on the phone? I know he also wanted to talk about um, moving the Vagrant to using um, to using Debian 9 instead of Ubuntu 18.04, because uh, apparently there, there's a problem with using the Ubuntu 18.04 boxes with libvirt. Uh, actually, his latest uh, update is about uh, Ubuntu 16.04. Oh. Uh, so... oh, okay, so he was trying 16.04, not 18.04? Uh, yeah, not the Bento 18.04, but gen general or ge generic uh, 16.04. Hmm. This is okay. due to D DNS ma mask. I don't remember something about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the nice things we may want to look at is, um, is frankly, this is another option we can take, which is that you can specify the box uh, conditional on the provider. So that basically, if your provider is libvirt, then you use oh yeah, whatever. And, and that, may, that, actually, that actually makes us quite a bit stronger because the, the, the broader set of environments that people are working in with network service mesh, um, the less likely we are to have something that works in one environment and not another. I, I was looking at this the other week. Uh, I mean, I did some code changes, but I haven't pushed anything because it was basically hypothetical and I never got as far as testing it. I've got a, um, well, it's now an 1804 box because I got frustrated and I upgraded it. Um, and I was trying to get libvirt to work. But um, another option rather than using Vagrant is actually to use Terraform directly against libvirt, which is probably the better approach to be perfectly honest. Um, it, it, but it does mean that you're not using a box, you need an image rather than a, a Vagrant box. Um, but uh, the problem with Vagrant boxes is they're always tied to a provider. So that actually works better in some regards. Yeah, I mean, it, it really kind of comes down to the, the, the make machinery was designed so that you could have different ways of, of approaching the problem. So there, there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with having uh, uh, you know, a, an MK file that will let you do Terraform with Libvirt directly. Uh, yeah, it, it, it ended up with another layer of indirection, um, which as we know, solves all problems. But it, it was, um, we have, I'm going to blame Frederick here because his, hand, his footprints were all over it. The make files are a bit funky because they're not really make files. They're just glorified script files in the form of a make file. But um, they're, um, uh, they're nested in such a way that if you change out the provider, you just basically change. It, it loads a different or uses a different set of make targets. Um, but if you use that same trick a, a level deeper, then you can basically make, use Terraform against different make targets. And that also works. Um, and I got it certainly part way. I, I can't say I'm proud of that particular piece of work yet, but the, the theory works. Um, you just use Terraform to, to uh, I think what I was doing is using Terraform to create the virtual machines as well as get them configured. And, th and that was making steady progress. And it also theoretically means, I, I think the long-term aim would be, uh, that would be a good one, is to use Terraform consistently for everything rather than doing Vagrant one way and, uh, and other things a different way. Um, but it, it, it gave some possibilities. Sorry, very, very woolly, I know, but um, I'm trying to work out how best to put that code up somewhere where someone can have a look at it. Cool. Well, before we dive down too much into this, we can stick that into the agenda as well. Yeah, I, um, we can, but seriously, it was like three weeks ago when I did this, and I can't remember what the hell I did. So it, the actual answer here is for me to stick that on GitHub um, with no promise that it works. So at least somebody can see whether or not I'm doing the right thing uh, or whether or not there might be a better approach there. Yeah, and I, I think I think we should probably put this further down the agenda. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do that. But but you know, I also don't want to make the perfect the enemy the good. Um, mm -hmm. so. Cool. Well, so, at the moment, the virtual, virtual box is my enemy because I can't run it uh, on the decent server that I have. So um, it limits what I can do. But um, that's why I was doing this because it was, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to get this thing working first, you have to shave a yak. That was where I got to, to use a pearlism. Are you sure you don't have to lex a yak? I think if you waxed it, that would probably be easier, but that's that's not how the uh, how the uh, saying goes. So. Also, you don't want an angry yak, and we should put that on the agenda later as well, or this could get into a very long discussion. Cool. So, who's going to get the uh, the meeting started? So, 
Um, welcome to the first. Welcome to the first meeting of the new year. So, uh, if you are new to the call, please add yourself to the agenda, and uh, let's make sure the agenda is posted on the chat. Well, it looks like it already is. So we'll get a, we'll get a message. And so. I'll go ahead and stick it there again. The, the chat <clears throat> only shows up if you're here when the chat message is sent. So if we got people who joined since the last time I put it there, <clears throat> now you have it again. Great. Right. And so um, agenda bashing. If there is something that you would like to talk about, uh, please add it to the, or please speak up now so we can add it to the agenda. Yeah, and don't be shy if something occurs to you as we go. Yeah, absolutely. And um, okay, so events. So we have FOSDEM. Um, I see Taylor just added something on the chat. Uh, is that something to add to the agenda? No, it was just about the Libvert with Terraform, which is pretty cool. Okay. Cool. So let's make, let's make sure that gets added as a link on the bottom. Um, okay. So we have so we have events. Uh, we have uh, FOSDEM Brussels coming up with a networking dev room in February second through third. Uh, Nikolai added a relevant talk, which he is going to include network service mission. Yeah, but that was that was actually not accepted, and um, yeah, I'm not traveling unfortunately. Ah, okay. So, is anyone going to pause them then, by any chance? Cause, or shall we shall we remove it? Okay, let's go ahead and um, uh, remove that. Cool. So we we have upcoming events coming uh, coming up. KubeCon EU, the call for paper closes on January eighteenth, and that is going to be held in Barcelona from May twentieth through twenty third. We also have Mobile World Congress coming up, which is in February 25 through 28. Um, so if you're involved with Mobile World Congress uh, and have a way of getting network service mesh uh, involved with some of the things you're doing, you know, definitely feel free to ask for any help or anything like that. We'll do as much as we can. Uh, we also have the ONS North America call for paper, which is going to close on January 21st, and that's going to be held in San Jose from April 3rd through April 5th. So, um, which is definitely going to have attendees because Frederick and I are both in the area. So, absolutely. And so let's. Um, and, and more, more importantly, the bar in the San Jose Convention Center is is a good place for us to hold it at a happy hour. Uh, and, and it has reasonable selection of beer as well, which is a, another step in the right direction. And if we don't like the bar there, I think it's in downtown San Jose. And if it is, then there's a lot of things around it. Uh, okay, so for I have a question for B Barcelona, actually. So um, is anyone planning to apply there for a paper? Or, because we actually don't have much time today, say, so we have... Ten days. Yeah. So for the KubeCon EU, I, I yeah. think we probably want to get a broad set of people submitting talks um, mm -hmm. on service mesh and on different network service mesh topics. So I would mm -hmm. strongly encourage people to submit talks. Um, you know, I've got a couple of ideas I'm batting around um, with Frederick. Do you want to talk about any of those here, Frederick? Or um, so are are you referring to the thing that I've been building uh, so far? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you know, whatever you'd like to do there is fine. Cool. Yeah. So one of the things that I've been uh, taking a look at is um, how can we, how, how can we take a look at something like um, uh, Envoy and see if we can uh, can chain Envoy into a in, in as a network service. And mm -hmm. so this has a variety of very powerful integrations that we can do, which may help with multi-cloud uh, or multi-cluster use cases, and uh, also solve potentially may also solve an issue that uh, uh, they currently have with Envoy and Istio at the moment, which is that you need to have a privileged init container 
startup and a uh, that uh, and uh, IP tables mangling, which may provide mm. a uh, opportunity for uh, for a security hole as it has it ends up uh, waiting to apply IP tables because it doesn't happen immediately. So there's so there's an opportunity there that we have and. There's also some interesting uh, use cases, like what happens if your envoy dies, or what happens if you decide to upgrade. So there's a lot of really nice features that we could uh, that we could add into that space. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm primarily working on how to on how to get that integrated in to to network service mesh, and it will likely turn into a talk at uh, at. KubeCon, and I'm just still making a decision on whether that'll be an ONS thing as well. So, Fred, Frederick, there's been some work done in the Istio community to replace the NIT container with a CNI driver. Ooh. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I'm, I'm pulling faces, but that, that <laughs> sounds like that's actually a step down rather than a step no, up. In order to use Envoy, first you have to change your platform. That, that's not no, promising. No, no. Yeah, it, it's 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 actually kind of um, clean. It's just it's a CNI plugin. It was done by um, Tib Swanson in Boxborough. Okay, Remi- remind me to tell him off next time I see him. <laughs> no, but, it, but it, actually, to be fair, that's useful information because if it was done by Tim, you know, he's a Cisco guy. I can go talk to him. Um, yes. We we can find out what he's thinking, uh, and maybe there are other options there because he probably doesn't know what we're up to. I, I point them to you guys too. So, um, but anyway, it, it, it's it's you know, it's, it's the same zip code, and people are tr- are, are trying to sell, solve the problem, Fred. So it's it's worthwhile solving. Mm. Well, can you add a can you add the name of the person uh, who's what so, they're doing? Because yeah, I'll, I'll, send, I'll, can... I'll stick some I'll stick some likes in the chat. Let me dig. Yeah, in. The way I'm looking at this is, is it's not about like trying to compete with them. It, there may actually be an integration point where where the techniques that they're using and the technique that we're using with our powers combined, you know, yes. we are. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so. yeah, well, well uh, he will almost certainly have a better understanding of the problem than we do. I mean, uh, well, all right, John knows what he's talking about, but I don't. Um, and, and Tim's basically um, uh, at the coalface. He, he's working on the stuff, so he probably understands these things better still. So regardless of whether he has any inclination to change his approach, it would be nicer if we understood the problem in its full detail, which he's almost certainly happy to explain to us. So there's the GitHub repository for HFC and I in the chat window. Cool. So... <clears throat> So, so in a nutshell, um, yeah, and I, I'm actually looking at uh, how to potentially integrate it using uh, using CNI as well, just to make it uh, just to make it easy. So there there really could be some some good crossover there. Um, so I, I I also saw we had something in the chat from um, Jeffrey about uh, something MPLS SDN NFP. You want to ask about that real quick, Jeffrey? Sorry, I'm double muted. Um, I was just curious, um, and unfortunately it overlaps with ONS, but um, I went uh, to Paris last year, and to be honest, the um, NFE MPLS SDN World of Congress is probably one of the best um, conventions I've ever been to. They had a lot of really, really smart people from EMEA in the US there, and I was just kind of curious if um, NSM is gonna start trying to push into that. Um, I mean, it's very SDN and NFE focused, so I feel like NSM is probably a good fit for that conference. So I think you're probably right. Um, so the question is, would you be interested in submitting a talk? <laughs> um, I'd have to do a lot of homework first. I don't want to go there and look like a goober in front of the entire world and put NSM back. So um, I could talk to you offline, Ed, about potentially doing that, but I would have to do quite a lot of homework. I've just started standing this stuff up in my lab with um, another homegrown Kubernetes project that we're building in-house trying to make them work together. So. Well, what week is that, Tarasco? Silly question. Um, the like second week of April. One sec, let me pull up my calendar. Okay. I because the last time I remember being in, I didn't go to it. I was near it at the time that it was on, and it was I think February or something. So I was a little wonky with that. 
Uh, yeah, it's the second week of April, like the second okay. Monday. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's definitely a good idea, though, because, and, and I guess, not meaning to put me too much on the spot, but I, I, two things are sort of behind my, my, my gentle nudge there. The first is, it's very good to have people who are actually trying to use the stuff talking about it. And the second is, um, it's good to broaden the base of people who are giving talks about network service mesh. So for, um, it, it, for, for that audience particularly, but, but this is probably true of ONS, it's, it's nice to talk about the technologies and how we put it together, but it's far more useful to show it doing things that are useful. And, um, you know, in, uh, in that regard, we should probably work out what would be a useful demonstration for that kind of audience. Exactly, right? I mean, so, you know, that's probably a very, um, useful thing to sort out. Yeah, with it being, you know, obviously MPLS being one of the big, you know, categories that it covers, it's very, very geared towards service providers like Charter and Deutsche Telekom and them. Like, I see a lot of my SP peers there. It's, like you said, it's probably the best conference I've ever been to. No offense to the Cisco Lifecraft. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, cool. Awesome. Anybody else have other events they think we should probably try and have some presence at? So, uh, so there is also the Container World uh, that happens every year in Santa Clara Convention Center. Uh, it's well attended and uh, probably that would also be, in fact, I got an invite uh, this year. Last year, I've given a presentation around cloud native um, architecture for telco. Probably we can uh, present about network service this year. Awesome. Could you add it to the agenda? And to the yes, I'll do that. Yeah. And then, you know, if you've, if you've spoken there before, uh, would you be interested in speaking there about service mesh? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, again, if we're, if we're putting this list together and it's going in the notes, then, then um, what appeals to the audience would be really, really useful information. Um, that, I think, is, again, right, we know at KubeCon then talking about Istio would be a fantastic thing. We know that ONS, if we start talking service provider, that would, that would definitely kind of um, start, um, um, whatever the phrase is, tweaking their nipples, probably not a good phrase, but, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, do we want to propose uh, both birds of feather uh, session for kubecon like, yeah, I think, yeah. I think so yeah yeah and and that that's probably a very good idea and possibly a bit more organized than, than what we did in in Cuba, north america which was less organized than i had intended um not just a buff i think but a social session would help because um you know um we we got a large crowd in the boff, a small crowd followed us out, and a smaller crowd sat down to chat about it in a bar afterwards. But, um, but the last part of that is probably the most useful uh, in the sense that we get more people involved and invested, um, and that's really what we could do with. Okay. So if we actually set this up with a social session, if, we're not, if we can find a way not to conflict with all the other events, then, then that would be, even if it's lunch, you know, something like that. This time, Ian, try and keep the napkin. Uh, it wasn't a napkin. It was it was Heather's notepad, and I'm sure she still has it. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Right. So um, this is all good feedback, and um, one of the things that we need to make sure that we add in on this is uh, due dates for call for papers. And I think the closest one with uh, did we say Mobile World Congress still has an open. Uh, uh, date? I'm not sure Mobile World Congress is much of a papery sort of conference, not that I've been, but um, I, I think it's more the sort of thing where demonstrations on, on vendor stands is probably what we'd be able to get. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but I think the closest one is KubeCon, isn't there? The, I know there's a set of deadlines on January the 14th or 10th. There's, it's one coming almost imminently that we need to keep an eye on. Yeah, January 18th for, for KubeCon EU. Mm. There was another one as well. Somebody, somebody from the marketing organization mailed me. Let me just see what I can find out. 
Well, if when you uh, find if you find any additional information, can you add it to the uh, to the upcoming events um, section? I'm going to continue on with the, um, with the yeah, agenda. Yeah. Will do. Will do. Keep going. Cool. Thank you. So, um, the main topic that I want to start with is the is about the repo location. So right now, the repo is stored within Legato, and Legato has been absolutely fantastic and uh, very gracious with. Uh, letting us use their space to get started. But as we look at our direction moving forward, there's a couple things coming up where keeping it in the Gato may not be the best choice. So the first one is uh, it, it is an independent project. It's not part of the Gato, which may cause some issues when we start to uh, approach groups like CNCF uh, to become a member. And simultaneously, when we, w there's uh, been discussions about splitting up the repo into multiple repos and uh, having a, basically flooding the Legato namespace is, uh, is not good uh, form. So I own the network service mesh uh, group in, um, in GitHub. And so my recommendation is that uh, we move the, the network service mesh repo to the network service mesh group and add all the appropriate um, um, credentials and so on. Uh, and the main thing we'll have to look at in, in this particular path is going to be the Circle CI integration and make sure that all our webhooks work and so on. Um, and besides that, uh, it should be a relatively straightforward move. So anyways, uh, we'll leave the, the topic open so uh, for comments or, or questions for now. Oh, well, okay. I'm definitely positive about this. I mean, like, it sounds like it makes sense. Uh, I don't know if we need to vote or what. Uh, what would be the the, the procedure to, to decide if we if we want to move there or or stay here with Legato. For these kinds of decisions, typically, I think that the, the best first step is to express um, their opinions. Um, often, when people express opinions, you'll get a sense of consensus. If there's some disagreement, we might fall back to voting. Um, but I, I, I tend to I, I tend to prefer consensus as a way of sort of sorting out these questions. Mm -hmm. And then the the next thing is to sort of ask, okay, well, what would be involved, right? So I, I'd be curious in hearing a broader set of thoughts and opinions from folks. Um, on the notion of doing this. And I know you've also given some thought, uh, Nikolai, to how we might divide into multiple repos. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we may want to talk about what that might look like. Yeah, but, but I mean, we, we already have at least the main repo and the site. So at least two repos can end up in that new group. Oh, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, of, eventually, if you want to split the main repo, into uh, examples and core SDK, whatever we, we define there. Yeah, um, so you already know my opinion, considering I, uh, I brought it up, so. <laughs> yeah, do other folks have thoughts or opinions on the subject? Well, we want to do this by stages. I mean, granted that um, we want to move this out of Legato, but, but you know, let's do that first because we, that seems to be least contentious and then figure out the splitting afterwards. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's uh, step one is move. We'll start with the simplest repo. We'll start with Legato site, get the website working again, then We'll move the network service mesh, get the CI working, you know, make sure that everything is, is working and that makes, make sure the community is not having any problems committing to it or doing pull requests and so on. And then we, and then we step forward. And I think we also need to have some documentation up on the page as to how to, how to, ch how to update your Git repo to point to the new, actually it should do forwarding automatically, but it's probably still a good idea to, uh, 
to point to the network service mesh repo directly? It, it's trivial to explain how to do a Git remote update. So, you know, it's a one line command. So as long as we put the documentation there, we should be good. My, my suggestion would be to embrace the healing power of and. Yeah, we could even turn it into a script. Run the script, it fixes your repo. You can't do that 100% reliably for Git repos, but yeah, I mean, we can do something to make it as trivial as possible. 99% of people, unless they're doing something really funky, are not going to have a difficulty. So. So it sounds like there's it sounds like there is consensus towards this. Uh, is there anyone who thinks it's not a not a good idea? That's a good idea. So the the comment was that it looks like the NSM user is uh, is inactive, and we could ask GitHub if they're willing to uh, to force a relinquishing of the NSM and uh, to give it to us. Um, we we can reach out to them as well. That that is a that is a possibility. And one other comment. Oh, no other comment. Okay, so in um, in that particular scenario, yeah, that, let's um, let's go ahead and start putting together some. Uh, uh, let, let's start let's start putting together some uh, information on this. We'll um, I'll reach out to uh, GitHub today, and I'll I'll ask them about the NSM thing. Barring barring any, uh, if if they say no, then. Like I, like I said, I think we should move the Legato site first, and we may need uh, we may we may need to ask. Uh, actually, Ed, who who owns that? Is is uh, the uh, I forget the name of, of was it Netlify? Uh, who who owns the account that uh, that does the publishing? Is it my you? Guess, or my guess is that because Kyle set up the Netlify account, that he's the one who um, owns the credentials for the Netlify account. Um, I believe, if memory serves, that I currently own the domain name. Um, so I will reach out to Kyle and see what we can do about getting credentials to the Netlify account. But worst case scenario, um, we just create a new Netlify account um, and share the credentials a little bit more appropriately that from there um, and move the domain over to it. Okay, so I think we got some initial actions to uh, to make this happen. Then, um, is there any other comments before we before we move on? Cool. In that scenario, um, Nikolai, uh, you have an option on, or you have a space for Go SDK. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Sometime before uh, KubeCon North America, like in the beginning of December, I started uh, trying to extract the common code from all the examples that we have and try to put it in a kind of an SDK. Uh, actually, I didn't know that it's an SDK uh, until Ed told me that it is. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I have a PR there. I put some work there. Uh, it uh, already reviewed it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will try to uh, to adhere to his uh, c comments. Uh, of course, for the time being, uh, it was mostly about just extracting the common parts. There's no real big uh, crazy design. My, please don't ever adhere to my commands. If you want to think about my suggestions, that's great. But but you know everything. Yeah. Is yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I I will try to 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 do as close as possible to whatever you're pro proposing. I mean, I'm still trying to evaluate uh, how how it could look like. I, I already changed some namings there, uh, and uh, refactored it a, it a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the idea is that we end up with an easy way to create uh, services in Go. Okay, not only services, uh, network services, 
and endpoints, but also clients, uh, and uh, uh, this should be really t trivial. So uh, whatever Fred was showing uh, on the stage uh, at KubeCon, uh, also on the, the VPP con conference there, uh, uh, should be really trivial. I mean, it should be really, really easy to do it uh, after the SDK uh, gets uh, gets merged. Um, I strongly suggest and would use any comment. So if if anyone can, anyone interested, please just uh, uh, see the PR. It's uh, 604, the pull request. Uh, I probably need to change its naming because uh, it's, not, it's not really great. But uh, uh, if you don't want to go into details, you can at least uh, see the how the examples look like to today. And maybe you can have a better idea of what what uh, uh, what it's uh, what's in the queue about it now and if um, you have uh, and better ideas just share their comment suggest <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, if um, the um, I, I'll have a look at it, um, cause, uh, but I'm prejudging here, so, so I'm going to apologize. If, if you haven't put documentation in there for everything you'd like to document, then at least make sure there's some placeholder documents. Just readmes or in, you know, installs mm -hmm. or how to yeah. use documents. They don't have to contain anything, but if they're there, then at least everybody's clear that they're missing. If they're not there, people don't notice that until too late. Um, and then anyone mm -hmm. can come along and kind of help document what you're doing afterwards. You don't need to get it in in the first round. Yeah, thanks. Yes, I I had this this in mind. I was looking at uh, some options how how we can put um, at least most of the documentation within the code because that's what would make sense for an SDK. Um, I'm not sure if if I can get the doc documentation on uh, Go Docs before I get this merge. So it's a bit I don't know. But Pla yeah. placeholders, as I say, it's it's most it's not so important that you write the documentation. It's more important that you point out what's missing, so that the next person who comes along to edit the files can knows what they need to add. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't stick any th sort of clues that there's missing documentation there, then anyone who's doing a bit of code editing won't won't add things. So so all I'm saying is um, leave leave space for it. You know, make okay. it obvious that it's missing. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Uh, so that's that's about the the the, the SDK. Uh, next uh, topic is uh, still again from me, so I will I will continue. So it's a call for unit test. So I started doing something there. Uh, it uh, merged my uh, selector uh, unit tests uh, yesterday. I will try to add more. I think that we need this, and actually, my idea was to 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 propose to focus our main efforts there for a week, two, or even a month, and not kind of focus on new things before we get some at least some unit test coverage. Because if you run make test today, you will see that it's uh, kind of not really existing. I mean, there are just a few of them. Um, but yeah, uh, the more we get, the better. I see that in the new PRs that we get, there are already unit tests. I mean, they come with unit tests. That's great. Thank you guys from Exhort uh, for, for, for doing this. And I think that this is, this is the way to go. Oh, that's it. If anyone has any comments, yeah, you, 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 more unit tests are definitely good, um, and and it's also for folks who are looking to get involved. Um, basically, writing testing, writing documentation are always good sort of first efforts as you're getting involved. Uh, you learn a hell of a lot about a system when you sit down to try and write some unit tests for pieces of it, because you know the first step when writing unit tests is okay, what actually is supposed to be happening here. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Yes, yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I just noticed that there is an open issue. Um, it's about 
trying to do some documentations for the uh, ICNP examples for because I'm a newcomer. So uh, uh, it'll be really, uh, really looking forward for those kind of documentations to uh, try to get some hands on uh, I mean, examples so that I can try to uh, follow up and to uh, catch up the rhythm. Yeah, this, this one specifically is a bit tricky because uh, if we manage to introduce the SDK, and I suggest that you look at this PR that we that we have about the, 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 the SDK, this will change the way that these examples are uh, written, oh, really? the, the approach, yes. Oh, really? Oh, really? And that's the idea actually to make it much, much, much easier and to not, you know, need to know all the details of setting up the connections and et cetera, et cetera. Just, you know, implement an interface and you're in the game. Yeah. Oh, or, thanks so much. Yeah, that's helpful. Or, or even better yet, hopefully get to a place where most of your work is taking some cookie cutter components off the shelf and <laughs> yeah. having some config in them um, and away you go. Um, that would be, you know, even better. And I know that's kind of the direction that you're going, which is, okay, here's the cookie cutter component for ACLs. Okay, shove some config in that, add it, you know, and plug it in like this, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, uh, and to take it a step further as well, if you're a CNF uh, provider, then having something as well on the other side where you can, uh, you can effectively, uh, like if your CNF only works with kernel interfaces then, and you specify that as a config, then that's what you get. Or if you support uh, MemIF or you support vhost user or so on, like all of this, all of these preliminary things to set up the initial connection and shared memory and all that kind of stuff. Uh, having something that deals with all that so you can just focus purely on your, on your logic, uh, I think is gonna be uh, very powerful. So that's, we're, we're trying to make, we're, we're trying to make that as, as easy as, as easy as possible. Um, okay, so the next one, I'm not entirely sure what the problem was. So can somebody give a description of what the problem was so that we can talk about why people were talking about Ubuntu with Bento or without Bento or Debian or, you know, Yeah, so um, we were briefly discussing the details with uh, Matthew on on the chat today. Um, essentially, yeah. he says 1804 uses systemd resolver, which seems incompatible with DNS mask. Then DNS is broken inside the guest, and this is used by libvirt provider. That's what he yeah. says. Let's, 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 let's back up ever so slightly. Um, which is Mathieu wants something that lots of other people want. He would like yeah. to be libvirt with the existing vagrant pieces, right? So he submitted a patch 577 <clears throat> trying to get vagrant working with libvirt. Um, in the course of this, there's been sort of a lot of back and forth trying to make this work and not break other things. So for example, one of the things he discovered was that to make this work, he needed to use SSHFS. Uh, SSHFS doesn't work with the VMware provider for Vagrant. Um, so there was a lot of sort of dancing around these things. He got all this working with a Debian 9 box. And then I sort of suggested, mm, could we make this work with an 1804 box? He was sort of poking around that. Um, you know, and I think probably for the immediate set of needs, which is trying to prevent Mitsu from having to rebase this stupid patch every time he moves. Um, we can probably just make the box choice dependent on the provider, um, and that will probably work. Now, there's a broader conversation here about what a smarter medium to longer term plan would be, which I think gets into um, the set of stuff that um, was sort of that Ian was chatting about against around Terraform and bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. And I think that's all a good idea. I think doing that to the exclusion of solving Mitsu's immediate problem would be an example of letting the perfect, um, you know, the, the perfect crowd out the good. Because I think we can probably solve Metu's immediate problem fairly quickly um, and get that piece unlocked. But I think it would also be good to look at um, ways to, and Terraform maybe the way to do it, to go and try and do this much more broadly, um, particularly since we'd like to be able to run across a broader set of providers 
um, routinely. So I, I know, for example, I'd like working on GCE and AWS and other places. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, when I was looking at this, then the, there are certain things that Vagrant's quite good at, including making sure that you're basically using your local copy of code in, in all of your Vagrant boxes, hence SSHFS, among other things. But um, it, it's um, the problem you're going to run into there is that, that Vagrant's quite, well, it's two things. It's very opinionated and it's quite limited. Um, tariff, um, uh, and, and honestly, its providers are very weird, as in, no two providers look very similar, so you end up rewriting a lot of code just to to kind of get the next provider to work, which is I think where uh, a chunk of where the the current change is going. And I, I'm absolutely not saying we should stop doing that and we should start working on Terraform instead. I'm saying that I think a bit of development work on Terraform might obsolete this in the longer term, and that would be worth doing. So so that's what I'm saying why I'm saying we should focus on the Terraform stuff as well, which would be quite nice um, because we've also got the packet.net code, which is separate. Again, it's a third backend with its own set of scripts. Um, and I'm wondering whether that could be Terraformed at some point in the future. Um, yeah. But uh, requirement the wise then, well, go on. Yeah, so the only problem, uh, per perhaps, perhaps there's a, a library out there which solves this, but there's no uh, Terraform Kubernetes installer. So I had to install Kubernetes using a set of scripts in order to, in order to make it work. So if Terraform had something that would install a cluster for you, then it'd be a lot easier to to just to use Terraform for the entire lot. Yeah, but you, I mean, again, you've already done that. So, um, and you've done it in Terraform as well for, for one platform or another. So the question is, can we basically recycle that for every platform? Because once you brought a, you know, the, the thing about Terraform that's specific to Terraform is bringing the virtual machines or the hosts up initially. But once they're up, then every single bit of Terraform should be the same for all platforms. So that was the thing that I thought was exciting, that we basically write it once. And every time someone fixes it, it sticks for everybody, which is uh, advantageous over like the two or three varieties that we have today. But I agree, it would be nice if there was such a thing as a Kubernetes deployer, but I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with the approach you've done already. Uh, I, I understand. So, so your idea is basically to to extend out the Terraform stuff that I did, and have a target uh, of Vagrant or target other other things. In an ideal world, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure how feasible that is for Vagrant itself. Annoying because I know that's where we start and what most people have. But let, let's just see what's possible. I mean, theoretically, Vagrant you can SSH into a Vagrant box, so you should be able to make the Terraform work. And I'd be amazed if someone hadn't tried testing their Terraform scripts against Vagrant boxes. So um, there's a bit of investigation. Hey, Ian, I'd be willing to explore this with you. We're still kind of battling legal internally, but uh, your uh, favorite guy, Brandon, and I have been working on some stuff exactly in this space with like around Terraform and deploying Kubernetes and things. So um, I don't know when we're going to be allowed to share it. We're trying to hope get it in this first quarter but um if we do get the green light to open source that i think we could leverage a lot of that code if you want a, a conversation offline then we can see it rather than sharing your code you can at least tell me what your thoughts are and maybe i can steal your thoughts which are a little bit less um, um legally encumbered shall we say um but um we we can figure something out one way or the other i mean it just feels to me I mean, I'm, I'm, firstly, I'm sure people have deployed Kubernetes with Terraform, but secondly, quite honestly, for the purposes we have, then there's nothing fundamentally wrong with what Frederick's doing. So um, I, I don't think we're, um, I, I think this is in reaching distance. I just don't know quite how long it would take to, to get it to the point that you'd want to develop that way. Um, but if we could get this running on, you know, AWS to take one example, and fine, you, you well, I won't say you can't have it's SRIV and AWS, but it's not exactly easy to work with, and it gets bloody expensive very quickly. But but AWS would give us the ability to do tests with more, far more infrastructure than you're ever going to run on your laptop with a Vagrant system. Um, so you know, there's some real possibilities there. Uh, okay, so. Is so action items. Is, is anyone want to take a look at some of this stuff? I will post what I've got, which is frankly embarrassing, but it was heading off in the right. And, and, and I think it's more theory than practice. I don't know how far tested I got, um, but I, I'll stick it up on my GitHub and, and, you know, for the purposes of making it visible to people, I'll put a pull request in 
Um, and then you can see where I was going with it. But uh, it may be that we want to dispose of that and start in a slightly different direction. Um, but yeah, and then I can take a take a shot with Jeff and we can see what we can do. Okay, cool. So I'll uh, wait for your um, for your GitHub repo. Um, okay, finally. There's, uh, some, there's some parity with the uh, cross cloud projects since we're it's all built on Terraform and we've been using that for all the cloud providers, um, including Packet. We've done a little bit with KVM in the past. But I'm interested in seeing the code once you push that up. Yeah, it's nothing to be proud of. Let's be clear. If you've got something as a reference, where, wherever that is, if that's out, out on the on the web somewhere, can you can you stick a link in the uh, in the notes, the meeting notes? Sure. The code that I'm talking about is targeting the cloud. So we we are mm -hmm. using a lot of the other providers. We're not currently targeting Libvirt. So that's, that's fine because that, that, that's only one little bit of the code that I have to change. I'd just love to see your examples because we, we should be, sure. well, two things, right? I'm not very well educated in Terraform. So reading more Terraform helps me understand how to write good Terraform. But, um, but the other one is that it's, there's probably things, ideas that we can reuse for, for what we're doing. So Awesome. Okay, so we have uh, nine more minutes. Um, Nikolai, do you think we have enough time to go over the roadmap, or may maybe what we should do is just uh, start talking about it initially with with some of the high level stuff? Yeah, and yeah. That's a, that was actually the proposal to just bring up the topic and say, okay, we really need to to, to start defining at least high level goals of or maybe some milestones like. Uh, KubeCon, for example, uh, or things like that, and say, okay, we want to do this by by this month, and try uh, to achieve it. I mean, and, and, and frankly, even just collecting the list of things that we could be working towards is a good first start. Mm -hmm. And then we can sort of sort out what are the orders and and what um, you know what we want to try and achieve by when. So, for example, um, you know, some of the things that have gone by. I know we've got. You know, folks working right now on um, the robustness story. In other words, making mm -hmm. sure that come back correctly when various components in the system die, or at least as correctly as can be done. Um, and part of this ends up being some of the stuff with auto healing, um, because it turns out that auto healing just sort of falls out when you make the system more robust, uh, or you would actually almost have to do effort not to. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, so that's one piece, and I think that's that's kind of critical. Um, then. Do we want to take notes on some of this? So, um, robustness story, auto healing as a part of that. Um, then um, we've got inner domain. There's been some thoughts about doing, um, you know, how to handle interactions between multiple. Uh, NSM registry domains. Mm -hmm. so it would be things like uh, multi-cloud, um, et cetera stuff. Um, we've had some discussion about that. There's a whole bunch of stuff around what I would sort of call um, deploy, uh, debugability. Yeah. And deploying. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's definitely, um, and this is this is basically, this is not so much I'm a developer, I can debug things. It's more of a, I have a production system and something went wrong, what the fuck, right? <laughs> um, I, I know Jeffrey has no idea what that's like. Um, so definitely, um, definitely open tracing is something there, and I, there's some work underway. Um, the other thing that, that comes immediately to mind is IOAM. Um, because I think we may be able to use um, IOM to do open tracing style things at L2 and L3. So we could actually do some of that because you're going to have, as, the, as people do what's going to come naturally, which is balkanizing to more and more microservices, you're going to want to know where things went. Um, so you've got that for debuggability and deployment. There's also security. 
And I tend to think of this in terms of um, how to properly um, authenticate and authorize um, to access an NSE is certainly one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, there are probably others. Um, Maybe con connection encryption on data plane level? Mm, data plane connection encryption. I, I would actually say that's probably a thing, but I don't know what it looks like yet, which is why I'm going to stick the, the question mark there. Yeah. Um, mm, that one, that one's a tricky one because it's something that you'd expect the service to provide, but um, uh, there might be a question about how to advertise facilities like this is an encrypted connection and it's an encrypted connection you're looking like you're looking for. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that there's interested in, in things like SRV six, um, MPLS or GRE. Uh, or, or just straight MPLS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's, there's so many ways that one might do the um, MPLS stuff. Um, although for me, MP, straight MPLS is MPLS. Yeah. So there are two things. These are remote mechanisms, um, not payload. Um, so I can imagine MPLS is always going to go over at least something like Ethernet, right? But as yeah, payload, but that might be physical Ethernet, and therefore you might be right down the down to. Um, you, you know, down to the wire at that point. Um, and I, I think um, we, we've had this, thank you for saying that, hardware support. So not just the NIC, though, that's my point. It, it can also be um, the thing that the NIC's connected to. If you're putting a data plane together um, and the data plane does the XLAN, that's great. All you need is layer three connectivity. Now, is layer three connectivity a thing you have normally? Yes. But if it's MPLS, you need more than just layer three connectivity. So we can't pretend that the hardware isn't a network service or might not be a network service in its own right that other network services consume. Uh, we've, we've got to remember that, that everything is, it's got features and maybe it's got all the features we're looking for and maybe it hasn't and maybe we should be asking before we make assumptions. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I'm, I totally get that. Um, so basically, when I say hardware NIC, you know, I mean not just you know the, the sort of NIC. There's there's PFDF, SROV, Tor port. Making sure we've got the the right kind of space left so we could do things like SMTP when it comes up, which looks quite interesting. So there's definitely some stuff around that. Um, that's good yeah, but but I'm saying that it's not just the NIC. It's also the the fabric that the NIC. Oh Jesus Christ! I can't even. Right, so fabric. I tried to capture that with the Tor port. Okay, well, that's not a Nick support, is it then? Also, don't don't forget things like the create verb and things related towards um, yeah. uh, auto provisioning and so on. No, I, I'm a huge what, fan. What? I'm very happy about create verb. Yeah, yeah. What's the create verb for the uninitiated? You're talking cryptic. Um, so right now in the network service, when you specify a match in the network service, um, the, the only verb that we have is route, which basically says, okay, if you match this, please route me to a destination that, that has that has labels that match. And that's a super powerful, um, super powerful verb. Um, there are two other verbs that we sort of hummed a few bars about in PRs. Um, the first one is the right verb, which is basically saying, okay, Somebody asked for this network service with these labels, um, but you know the world has shifted and they're a legacy, and so please rewrite the the request a little bit this way and then reprocess it. Right. Um, the second one is the create verb, which is super sexy because the create verb basically says, "Okay, um, somebody asked for this network service. Please, you know, please create a network service endpoint at the scope um, and then connect them to it." And by the way, here's the policy for how you tear it down when something like, you know, 10 minutes idle and this is passed when nobody's connected. And um, so the create verb basically allows us to dynamically create network service endpoints on demand, which becomes super, super interesting in lots of cases, not the least of which is Edge. Mm, okay, that's not the way I would view the common model of service discovery we have, but okay, I, I think I see where you're going with this. Uh, I'd like a longer conversation than the, on that, and that's not one that we're going to manage in the remaining time today. So I, I agree. There are there are issues that hum a few bars about the create verb stuff. If you want to go look for them, um, so they're they're fairly recent. <coughs> so I know there's interest in the create verb stuff. I think we're right up against the hour. 
Um, are there other things we want to kind of add to the laundry list? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn all of this into a Word, or sorry, a Google Doc. And that way we can uh, put links to it and all that kind of stuff. And I think some of the roadmap items that we're talking about uh, may not end up fitting the GitHub issue stuff. So it might make sense to keep it as a Google Doc. But uh, I mean, if, if it's basically um, brainstorming ideas, then a Google Doc's often better for that anyway, because you can edit what's there, add notes. It's just much easier to, than, than a string of comments. So it makes sense to me. Yeah, can I make a selfish request? Sure. Can, instead of just strictly SRV6, could we just look at segment routing holistically? Because um, different parts of my convoluted network are going to implement SR in different ways. So that's why I asked for just straight MPLS2 is I would be very interested in not just SRV6, but also SR MPLS if possible. Mm -hmm. And, and then PLS is a, a multitude of sins as well, because you've got a data, a control plane that goes with it, which varies. But uh, it's the, the, the point is that we need something which is an abstract description of a connection. Um, and the more examples we can throw at it, the more sure we can be we've got to the abstract and not we haven't made assumptions about the data plane that we're talking about. And I hesitate to use the word data plane because that's not necessarily what this is going to be, but you know. Well, we're, we're out of time, but what I recommend is we add this to the, uh, to the next week's agenda. We can discuss what this really means. Yeah. Uh, I, think the, I think the short answer is going to be I, I, that, well, I personally think it's a good idea. Um, and with that, um, thank you for attending the, um, the year's first meeting. The next meeting is going to be at the same time in uh, one week from now. So thank you all, and um, catch you next week. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Happy New Year.